long ago And I passed up many chances To share in its last gold And I know someday it will vanish And sail beyond life's treacherous gold to the book of John chapter 17. John chapter 17. For about half a year now, we have been in a study on the gospel of John. And tonight we are in John chapter 17. And next Wednesday night, we will conclude our study on the gospel of John. John chapter 17. In the 17th chapter of the book of John, this is a prayer that Jesus prayed as he was approaching the Garden of Gethsemane just moments before he was betrayed by his own disciple, Judas Iscariot, for 30 pieces of silver. He was going to be arrested, tried in an unfair court, whipped and beaten, hung on a cross to die for the sins of this world. And as we look through this chapter of John chapter 17, I want you to listen carefully to the words that Jesus is speaking. And think of what was going on in his mind as he was facing the cross of Calvary. As he thought of the, the price of the sin that he was paying for you and for me when he had us on his mind. John chapter 17, starting with verse number 1. The Bible says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou hast gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Let me stop right there. This verse number five, where Jesus said, Father, glorify thou me 
with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. This is how we know, church, that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. If you look back at John chapter 1, we see that in the beginning was the Word. The Word represents Jesus Christ. The Word was with God and the Word was God. This same Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten Son of God. If the Son was non-existent until the time that He was manifested in the flesh, then how could he have been with the Father before the world was created? In verse number 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Right here, Jesus is assuring us through this prayer that he has been in this world and he has been glorifying the Father in what he has done. He has come to this world to do the work that God had called him to do. And because Jesus and the Father are one in unity, he is letting us know that you and I can be at one in unity with He and the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse number 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in Thy name. Those that Thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus is the Good Shepherd who came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost in sin. Jesus saves those, and once they become saved, they are no longer lost, but they are now saved. But those who are not saved, in other words, those who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they are still lost. They are a child of perdition, which means they are headed for destruction. They are headed for hell unless they turn their life around and repent of their sins. Isaiah chapter 57 teaches on those who are rejecting the truth of God's word. And that is what Jesus is talking about by saying that the scriptures are being fulfilled. Verse 13. And now I come to thee. He's talking to the Father. He's saying, I'm going to come to thee. He's in reference to after the crucifixion. After the burial, after the resurrection, he's going to ascend to the Father. He's going to be seated at the right hand of the Father, Jesus said. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. In verse 15, in the New Living Translation, it says, and Jesus is praying here, it says, I am not asking you to take them. He's talking about the disciples, the church, the, the people that are following Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying, I'm not asking you to take them out of this world, but keep them safe. From the evil one. Jesus is going to return to heaven. He's going to be seated at the right hand of the Father. But in the meantime, He is going to leave His church here. He came to this world to establish His church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell 
will not prevail against it. Yes, God has given the church a work to do. He has given the disciples a work to do. Our job is to continue the work that Jesus came into this world to do. Our responsibility as a church and a child of God is to preach the never-ending message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus saves, that Jesus heals, that Jesus baptizes in the Holy Ghost, and Jesus is coming again. But in the midst of us doing the work of Jesus, Christ, there is still going to be persecution that comes against the church. There are still going to be times that the devil fights against the church. And if you do not believe that, then you have not been here in the past couple of weeks. I have never seen a time in which the devil has been fighting us here at How Assembly of God like he has in the past couple of weeks. Why is Satan trying to stop How Assembly of God? I believe it is because we have treaded in on the turf that he thought he deserved. When we had a kids crusade that many people thought that nobody would come to, all of a sudden we have a kids crusade, 13 people get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, two people get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, a couple of adults get saved by the grace of God and people are wanting to get baptized in water that were saved at a kids crusade. And so we come together on a Saturday night immediately after this kids crusade and we pray and we fast and we're asking God to pour His Spirit out upon this church and all of a sudden, one after another, sickness begins to affect different ones in our church. I end up getting sick. Sister Pat gets sick. Different ones. You have told me that things have been going on that, and, and it's as if the devil is trying to stop a work of God because when we do something for God, it makes hell upset. It makes hell angry. And, 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 and so Satan's doing everything he can to try to stop the church. But church, I want you to listen carefully. Jesus said, I will build my church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall be not prevail against the church. Let the storms come. Let the winds blow. You cannot stop the work of God. If God be for us, who can be against us? And we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And so Jesus is telling us that there are going to be times of, of persecution that the church is going to face. See, Jesus has finished the work that He came on this earth to do. The Father had a mission for Jesus and Jesus has glorified the Father on earth. And now there is a work for the people of God to do to glorify the Father, to glorify the Son through the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And so in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying that the church will not be taken out of this world before their work is done. You see, the idea of a Christian life, a lot of people think that, that once you get saved and you repent of your sins, that life is going to be easy, that, that life is going to be good, that you're never going to face a problem. I want to tell you, church, that if you will look into the Word of God, there has never been a time when a child of God has had it easy. But if you will look at what happened with the disciples, one time they were in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. They faced a storm. And in the midst of their storm, in the will of God, Jesus came to them walking on the water. But then there's another time in the Word of God that these disciples faced a storm while they were in the will of God. And in the midst of the storm, Jesus was already on the boat with them, which only goes to show one thing. If Jesus is not on board in your life, you're going to face a storm. But even if Jesus is on board in your life, you're still going to face a storm. You're going to face problems. You're going to face sickness. Sometimes it's going to seem that, that, that the, the Red Sea is in front of you and Pharaoh's army is behind you. But it's at times like that you don't give up. You don't give in. You don't throw in the town. But you hold up and you wait upon the Lord because they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We must wait upon the Lord. You see, when, when we're looking at, at what God wants us to do, in Acts chapter 17, verse 5 through 7, in the midst of the apostles' persecution in this world, the Bible tells us that 
These apostles are those that have turned this world upside down. How is that possible? It's because Jesus Christ had sent the Holy Ghost into their lives and had empowered them to make a difference in this world. You get full of the Holy Ghost. There is nothing in this world that can stop a child of God. You get full of the Holy Ghost and nothing in this world can stop what God is doing in your life. Verse number 16 of John chapter 17. Jesus is still praying here. He says, they are not of this world. Speaking of the church. Even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. In other words, make them holy. Make them righteous. Bring them to perfection. But how is that going to take place? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. A lot of people in this world today do not know what truth is. In the society in which we live, truth ends up becoming whatever the majority of people want. Whatever is popular. Whatever opinions float their boats, that's what they look to as the truth. But there is a truth that we can know. It is an ultimate truth that is found in the Word of God. It's the truth of God's Word. And Jesus said, if you continue in My Word, then are you My disciples indeed. And you will know this truth, and the truth will make you free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We must know the truth. And so Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's the Father's word that is the ultimate truth in this world. Verse number 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have I also sent them into the world. Jesus is sending the disciples into this world to preach the gospel, to make disciples, to baptize, to work in the gifts of the Spirit. Verse 19, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone. Jesus is not just praying for the disciples. He's not just praying for the people that He has ministered to in the past few years. But who else is He praying for? He says, neither pray I for these alone. But then he says, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That means Jesus is praying for the power of God to be upon not only the disciples, not just upon the early church, but for everyone who believes in Jesus Christ through the word of God. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. The disciple John, the beloved disciple John, also is the one who wrote the Gospel of John, the three epistles of John, the book of Revelation. He was a disciple of Jesus Christ. He saw every miracle that Jesus did. He was with Jesus day in and day out. He wrote what he saw. And so we get the Gospel of John. And when we read what the Apostle John has written in the Gospel of John, if you look at John chapter 3, verse 16, and when people read, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and when people believe in Jesus Christ and get saved because of what they have read in the Word of God, that lets us know, church, that when Jesus was praying there in the Garden of God, Gethsemane. And he says, Father, I pray for those that will come to believe through what these disciples begin to preach around this world. That lets us know that you and I was on the mind of Jesus Christ. That he had a desire that the gospel of this of, of, the, of the, the Lord Jesus would be preached around this world to every nation as a witness to the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse number 21. We see the purpose of all of this. He says that they all may be one, as Thou, Father, art in me and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me, and the glory which Thou, hast, which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and Thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that Thou hast sent me and hast loved them as Thou hast loved me. 
Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name. And I will declare that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. What Jesus is doing in these last few verses is that he is charging these disciples with a commission to preach the gospel. It is a very similar situation that we see when the Apostle Paul became a Christian and was filled with the Holy Ghost and called to preach after the day of Pentecost. And he was given his command and charge to Timothy to continue on the work that Paul had started. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 8, it's a very similar situation between Paul and Timothy and Jesus and the disciples. Paul told Timothy, he, he said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Just as it was when, when Jesus was, was facing the cross of Calvary, Paul also knew that he was fixing to be killed for preaching the gospel. Just like Jesus, the people rejected the message and they were going to kill him. And Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Jesus is preparing these disciples to continue the ministry, just like Paul did with Timothy. Jesus knew that in just a little while he was going to be arrested. He would be tried in an unfair court. No lawyer, no defense attorney. He would not be able to give in to any kind of a plea deal. But Jesus knew that he must suffer for crimes that he did not commit if men and women and boys and girls were to ever have a chance of eternal life and salvation. See, Jesus Christ expressed a sorrowful passion uncompared to anything else that's ever happened in this world before as he was suffering in agony there in the Garden of Gethsemane and as he was facing death upon the cross of Calvary. There has never been a more serious time of anguish, such as what we see in the Garden of Gethsemane. In fact, Mark chapter 14 tells us that Jesus prayed three times, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup of suffering pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. It is no wonder that as Jesus was praying, and as he was in agony and pain, as he was Facing the persecution that he knew that he would endure on the cross of Calvary, that the sweat began to fall as great drops of blood, and, and blood began to pour from the pores of his face. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Jesus said in Mark chapter 14, verse 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. I want you to understand something very important tonight. With God, all things are possible. 
But on that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was not possible for God to take away that cup of suffering and shame if men and women were to be saved from the sins. It was not possible for Jesus to atone of our sins without the shedding of blood because without the shedding of His blood, there is no remission of sins. It was not possible for healings to take place without the stripes that were soon to be upon Jesus' back from the cracking of the with. You see, it would not be possible for humanity to survive without the suffering of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus knew that He must go to the cross of Calvary to suffer and die for the sins of this world. And the time had now come as He finished praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. As we come to John chapter 18, we see the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. In John chapter 18, verse 1, the Bible says, when Jesus had spoken these words and is talking about his prayer, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where there was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oftentimes resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went back and fell to the ground. Then asked, then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am He. If therefore ye seek me, let these, speaking of the disciples, let these go their way, that the same might be fulfilled which He spake of them, which thou gavest me, I have lost none. Jesus made sure that His disciples were saved. He made sure the disciples were not arrested. He stood up for them to take full responsibility of preaching the Word of God. The Bible says in verse 10, Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me. Shall I not drink it? What we see here in verse 8 through 11 is a perfect example of the grace of God, of the mercy of God and God's forgiveness. You see, Jesus is the only one in the Garden of Gethsemane who is without sin. And likewise, He was the only one who was arrested. At the same time, He made sure that because the Roman soldiers said they were looking for Jesus, he ultimately told them that they should not bother with these disciples since He was the one that they came from. So that being the case, the disciples were free. They could have left. They could have minded their own business and everything would have been fine. They could have gone on without ever having to worry about getting into any trouble. But all of a sudden, things take a turn for the worse. Peter, in all of his rage, and all of his uh, fury, he decides to take a sword and cuts off the high priest's servants here. Now this is something that Peter just did, deserving of death. Was he trying to cut the, the servant's head off? Was he trying to kill him? I don't know. But what we do know is Peter took a sword, cut the man's ear off, and it laid on the ground. It's assault and battery. It's attempted murder with a deadly weapon. Peter could have instantly been arrested, tried, and sentenced to prison for life and even killed for taking a sword to the high priest's servant. But then the story takes a turn for the good. What does Jesus do? The Bible says that Jesus tells Peter, put away your sword. I'm sure the Roman soldiers would agree 100% with Jesus right there. Yes, Peter, you better put that sword away or you're going to prison. You don't pull your weapon out when the authorities are there trying to arrest someone. And so Jesus reaches down. He picks up the servant's ear, places it back on his head, 
and he's completely healed. And the servant is amazed that he's been healed. Jesus has just touched him. And so there is no mention here of Peter getting arrested. Why? Peter just took a sword to the high priest's servant. He cut his ear off. He needs to go to jail. But all of a sudden, nobody arrests him. Nothing else is ever mentioned about what Peter did. Think about this for just a second. If Peter had been arrested, given the circumstances that we see here in the Word of God, Peter is standing there before the, the, the court judge. He's listening to all the witnesses, all the people that was there. They all saw Peter take a sword. They saw Peter cut the, the, the man's ear off. They saw the ear lay down on the ground. And all of a sudden, the judge calls the servant up to the stand. The judge looks at the servant, has a question. Where's the damage? You know, if, if your ear has been cut off, then why do you still have an ear? There's no marks. There's no cuts. There's no bruises. There's no scrapes. Peter couldn't be arrested because the evidence was destroyed. See, that's what God's grace does. Not only was Peter forgiven, but the evidence was completely removed. It's as if it had never happened in the first place. That's what God's grace does in our life. He removes our sin. He doesn't just cover our sin, but He forgives us and He takes it away and removes it as far as the east is from the west. That's the grace of God. And so let's move on to verse number 12. This is where Jesus is taken prisoner. He's being taken to the high priest's house. The Bible says in verse 12, Then the band, talking about the soldiers and the captain and officers of the Jews, took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. So Jesus is brought before the high priest, and now we are about to see Peter's first denial. If you'll remember, when Jesus and the disciples were partaking of the Passover feast, Jesus had told Peter that he would deny knowing him three times before the rooster crows that night. In verse 15, and Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. And that disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. And the servants and the officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So the question was asked to Peter, Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Think about this for just a second. Peter knew who Jesus was. He knew of the miracles. He knew Jesus had power and authority. Peter was afraid for his very life. He was afraid to confess Jesus before man. And the Bible tells us that if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. This cost Peter very dearly. He denied knowing Jesus. He wanted to make it look good. See, Peter was, in his heart, he knew who Jesus was. But on the outward expression, he was afraid of it costing him his very life. He was afraid of it sending him into prison. And so Peter is pretending that he doesn't even know who Jesus is. So while all of this is going on, Jesus is being put on trial in the palace of the high priest. Verse 19. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard thee. 
What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. While Je so while Jesus is on trial here, Peter is outside denying that he knows who Jesus is. They're asking Peter. They're asking him questions. And, and, and Peter is denying who Jesus is. Verse 25. Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, therefore, unto him, art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off. In other words, this is the man that Peter cut his ear off. Peter knows this man. And this man knows Peter. If somebody tried to take a sword to my, to my head, I think I would remember their face. I'm not going to forget who they are. And so this servant comes up to Peter and he says, did I not see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again and immediately the cock crew. Other gospel accounts tell us that Peter even cursed. He was going to extreme measures to cover up his relationship with Jesus. He knew he had already been seen with Jesus. He knew that he had been seen taking a sword to the priest's servant's ear. And so to make his case more believable, Peter began to swear and the curse to try to show some proof that he is not a child of God, that he is not a disciple of Jesus. And so now Jesus is being brought before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. In verse 28, the Bible says, Then led a Jesus from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, in other words, a common criminal, we would, have, we, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself? Or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Jesus is telling Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world. This answer has two meanings. First of all, a, a government in a political sense is something that Jesus was not associated with. His kingdom was not of this world. His kingdom was the kingdom of God. His kingdom was a place whose builder and maker is God himself. You see, in the world's idea of a kingdom like what the Roman Empire had, Jesus was not affiliated with that. His kingdom was of God. Verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and saith unto them, I find in him no fault. In other words, I can't find any evidence to convict him. I can't find a legitimate reason to sentence him to any kind of punishment. He hasn't committed any crimes against the law. Verse 39. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. 
Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. It tells us in the word of God that every year around Passover time that the Jews would always release one prisoner. And Pilate recognizes this tradition and he gives the people of Jerusalem a choice. They could release Jesus, a man who is innocent, a man who has done no wrong, who is not guilty of any crime, or they could release Barabbas, a man who is known to be a thief, a robber, and a murderer. And the Bible tells us that the people chose to release Barabbas and they wanted to crucify Jesus. In John chapter 19, starting with verse 1, we see where Jesus is sentenced to death and is crucified on the cross of Calvary. Verse 1, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. He was whipped. He was beaten. I believe according to what history tells us when they would scourge a, a criminal in Judea in, the, in that time period, that they would take this whip that was lacerated with, with sharp objects and rock and bone and, and glass, and it would literally shred the skin on their back. And I believe that Jesus was beaten to a point to where he was unrecognizable. And the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail the King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Verse number 8, The Jews answered him, We have a law. And by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, twelve o'clock in the afternoon, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest to the Jews, uh, of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, 
but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he's talking about John, the disciple. He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he saith to the disciples, speaking of John, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon his lip and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with them. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith come there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus at the first which came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and, and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never a man laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh, at hand. In the history of the Roman Empire, crucifixion was never designed to kill someone just by hanging them on a cross. It was not the nails and the hanging on a cross that would kill an individual. But when the Roman soldiers would put an individual on a cross and they would uh, drive nails in their hands and in their feet and in some cases they would hang them with ropes and, and, and they would be hanging there on the cross as long as they had strength in their legs they could use their feet and their legs to raise up and they could continuously breathe but when the Roman soldiers got to a point to where they got tired of watching this individual suffer they would take their spear and swing it back and forth like a baseball bat right below the knee several times until they could snap these shin bones in two, causing their legs to completely break in two, taking away every bit of ability to raise themselves up to get air. And then as those people would be hanging there, no strength in their leg, their body, all this pressure would be coming up from their, from their neck down, they could no longer breathe. And in four to six minutes, they would be dead. And so the Bible is telling us that when they were watching this crucifixion event on Golgotha, they come to the first thief, they broke his legs. They come to the second thief, and they broke his legs. But when they come to Jesus, the Bible says that he was already dead. And so the the soldiers took the spear, pierced his side. And we see the evidence that Jesus was already dead when blood and water began to pour from the side of Jesus. You see, this spear wound was not the cause of his death. The nails was not the cause of his death. 
See, when the Roman soldiers saw that Jesus was already dead and they, they thrust a spear in his side, this was Bible prophecy coming to pass. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 says that they may look upon him who they have pierced. You see, that was one of the reasons Jesus was already dead. God had a plan from the very beginning that they were going to look upon the one that they had pierced. Zechariah's prophecy had to be fulfilled. You see, when a Roman soldier came to break Jesus' legs, he was dead. They, they wasn't going to break one of his legs. The Word of God wouldn't let it take place. The Bible tells us that in Psalms, not a bone of his body shall be broken. They couldn't break his legs because the Word of God would not allow it to take place. Zechariah told us hundreds of years before that we would look upon him that we had pierced. So what was it that took Jesus' life? No man took his life. No Roman soldier took the life of Jesus. But Jesus was able to do something that no other human being in this world could ever do. He laid down his life. Jesus had told the disciples, No greater love has any man than this, than he that would lay down his life for his friends. When he said it was finished, and he cried out with a loud voice. The Bible says that he gave up the ghost. He laid down his life for his friends. In John chapter 10, verse 17 through 18, the Bible says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment, have I received in my father? He laid down his life for you and for me. And when he was hanging there on the cross of Calvary, and he hung his head there and he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost and said, It is finished. The bondage is finished. Sin is finished. Sickness is finished. He did it all for you and for me, so that we would have life. Through His death, we can have life. Through His brokenness, we can be mended. Through His pain, through His suffering, through the stripes that was upon His back, we can receive healing. Because He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes, we are healed. No greater love like the love of Jesus Christ. He gave all that He had for you and for me. And there is still power in the precious blood that He shed on that cross. You see, the blood that Jesus shed on that cross on the hill of Calvary is the blood that still flows today. It's the blood that gives us strength. It's the blood that gives healing. It's the blood that brings salvation. So whatever we need in life, we just trust in Him. And we ask Him, Lord, let Your blood flow through my life. Let the blood of Jesus Christ wash away every sin. Wash away every stain. Let the blood of Jesus Christ bring healing into Your life. And when we let His blood change our life, we'll never be the same again. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Can we stand together across the sanctuary? Thank you for watching today. If we have reached you, we would like to hear from you. You can visit us online at howag.com or you can write to us at First Assembly of God, P.O. Box 97, Howe, Oklahoma, 74940. We invite you to worship with us at First Assembly of God, Sunday morning Sunday school at 930, morning worship at 1040. Sunday evenings at 6 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We also invite you to subscribe to our online YouTube channel or visit our Facebook page. We hope that you can join us again soon for another service from First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma.